Welcome to Bond University on iTunes U. Um, I wanted to respond to that by when I read the paper I saw these seven points and I thought well how do those seven points play out in preventive detention legislation in Queensland? And even if we saw those as an ideal scenario, I think it's fair to say that the preventive detention for sexual, dangerous sexual offenders in Queensland clearly doesn't even measure up to that. Um, and when we set up this legislation in Queensland, it was supposed to apply to violent sexual offenders or those who sex offended against children, sexual offences against children. And this is still being pushed in the courts. And most recently, the Court of Appeal had to deal with an application by um, the Attorney General for someone who had committed lots of acts of exposure um, and public masturbation, basically. They were the main acts that this person had committed over a history of criminal offending. And in this particular case, the Court was asking that um, that, sorry, the Attorney General was asking this to be rec recognised as imminently risky conduct, so could fit in the principle one, I guess. Um, luckily, the court said, from my perspective, I think anyway, the court said that this wasn't considered to be imminently risky conduct. But we can see that the Attorney General is trying to broaden this legislation and is still trying to put more people under this legislation. Um, in terms of risk and proportionality and least drastic means, I think those two things come together because they're really about, um, I suppose, aiming for community-based placements with, with treatment. And I think this has been interpreted in the legislation as being a case of what's practical rather than what's uh, possible. So the response <coughs> often when these arguments are made about, well, the least drastic means by the, uh, by the person representing uh, the person about to be detained is that they should be held in the community with these particular therapeutic um, responses. The response of the Attorney General is invariably, well, they're not available in the community, they're only available in the maximum security. Um, so that becomes the least drastic means in the context where the argument is that they're unavailable. The idea about a separate system or criminal justice primacy principle, obviously <coughs> we house our uh, people involved in uh, preventive or who are preventatively detained in Queensland in maximum security prison units. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that that's separate to um, ordinary punitive punishment. Clearly that is about the most punitive setting that anyone could be placed in for um, any kind of sentence and certainly it's hardly a uh, therapeutic context. Uh, so we're certainly falling down there. In terms of the assessments, the actuarial based assessments and the clinical risk assessments, in our legislation we're asking psychiatrists to make an analysis of dangerousness. So I think we're falling into the trap you're suggesting of focusing largely really on clinical assessments and if that is an ideal scenario, the actu actuarial based probability assessment, we're certainly not going there and people would argue that it's not ideal in any event, but certainly we're not doing that. The principle seven was periodic review and ensuring a, a voice of prisoners uh, because of all sorts of problems with our process and the increasing numbers of people involved in this process. Yes, there is theoret theoretically periodically periodic review, but it's often very late, much later than it's supposed to be because of these particular delays. When people do finally come to, to court for their hearing in relation to an application for their continued detention or review of their detention, um, they're underrepresented. They may well be represented and have theoretically a voice, but often their legal counsel has been advised two days before and they're completely under-resourced to actually truly give a voice to their clients, so there's a real problem here. I think, um, to be fair to the judiciary, they've made a real effort to reject this system and I think they're very frustrated with the process and their comments in many of the judgments suggest that, but nevertheless they're left with what they're confronted with and it's a, uh, it certainly doesn't measure up to your principle number seven. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too before handing over to Ali was I think two key problems in this process which are really neglected um, is that a lot of the people that are coming before preventive detention are exactly these people that people have been mentioning before. Um, essentially preventive detention is this dustbin for all of these people that we can't put anywhere else, we're sticking them in preventive detention. So we're seeing people with long histories of institutional involvement who Argue, arguably have difficulty with freedom, difficulty with 
a lack of supervision in the community. And so we say, well, we can't provide the supervision or the support you need in the community into preventive detention you go. So there's a lot of people with cognitive disabilities who are being placed onto programs that they're incapable of managing, coming to their review and saying they haven't done the program, therefore they have to go back to preventive detention to do the program, and yet there's no appropriate program there for them to do. So this is a real problem, I think, this particular field. And the other group, I think, is really problematic in this context and is really not given sufficient consideration is there is an over-representation of Indigenous people um, in the preventive detention system uh, in Queensland. Certainly uh, most of the Indigenous people that are coming before uh, this legislation are being placed on supervision orders, um, but they're very much caught up in this system with breaches and reviews. Um, and there's certainly uh, not really appropriate responses. And we heard before from the Late Line uh, program, that's obviously the problem in Queensland in terms of finding appropriate community-based mechanisms for that particular group, they're, they're certainly lacking. So I think if we go back to what was happening this morning, talking about asylum, this idea of asylum, and how we can kind of figure out a supported environment in the community, um, for those people who are sometimes placed in uh, preventive detention, perhaps released on a supervision order and manufacture a breach in order to go back into a supervised situation in prison because there is nothing else at present. So I think there's a real gap in our system for this group and um, I think that's a struggle. We, it's not really for criminal lawyers to deal with that in a sense, but we're sort of doing that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to Patrick and also thank you to Chris for the paper. Um, by way of response, I'm actually going oh. to focus in on the particular issue of p preventative detention of those with serious mental disorders. And as um, Chris and Heather and I have discussed, that's my own um, area of interest. And I approach it from a socio-historical perspective. So I'm going to change the tone of the debate a little bit and talk less about the normative issues that we've been discussing and more about something about where this part of criminal law and process has come from. So setting um, what appears to be the special position of people with mental disorder facing a criminal conviction in historical light, I want to suggest that the longevity or durability of executive or executive style discretion over individuals in this cohort helps us to understand preventative detention regimes. And I want to lead to conclude by raising what might be potentially a salient point of difference between the two systems contrasted in Chris's paper, the European and the US um, traditions. And I'm going to do all of this in my five minutes, um, that I, the five minutes that I have from Patrick. Okay, so at the end of the time, the, at the end of Chris's paper, he discusses, in discussing the two cases, um, M and Kansas and Hendrix, um, Chris concludes that the European Court may be more hostile than the Supreme Court to post-sentence preventative detention based solely on assessments of risk. And I think we could probably say that this might reflect broad differences in the US criminal justice system and the European tradition that have been analysed under the label of penal populism, law and order politics, terms with which I think we're, we're probably fairly familiar. But if we look specifically at the issue of mentally disordered offenders, we actually see that there are strong similarities in these two traditions. These similarities include the long-standing practice of definitely those who've raised the insanity defence successfully and those who've been successfully or have been found unfit to stand trial, unfit to plead. And I wonder in trying to account for these uh, notable similarities and this broad continuity over time, whether it might be useful to think about the wider tradition of executive or executive style discretion over people with mental disorders and what this does to our understanding of um, preventative detention regimes. So although the disposal of insanity equities and the response to findings of unfitness is now buried in a very dense mix of statutes and other procedures in all jurisdictions. It's striking to me that in the common law world, the origins of what are now formalised and formal rules and procedures ha are in informal discretionary executive practices. The origins of these principles and processes date from a time when local magistrates and others were exercising a range of administrative and judicial functions without a robust or clear distinction between the two. And it's also worth noting, as I think we might all recall, that such powers were originally exercised by the monarch, him or herself, and then later in the name of the monarch with, as we know, the famous phrase, indefinite detention at his or her majesty's pleasure reflecting the idea that clemency, but also responsibility in some sense, resided in the sovereign, the embodiment of the executive. 
even as criminal processes underwent significant changes, which elsewhere I've argued under, can be analysed under the label of formalisation, um, the processes relating to insane and unfit defendants, for instance, remained informal and discretionary. So even after we started to have rules about what constituted a successful insanity claim, McNaughton, and principles around unfitness to plead, the case of Pritchard, very few years apart, we actually saw disposal remain indefinite, and some of the other really relevant considerations around those individuals remain open textured and discretionary. So in the UK context, the indefinite detention faced by insanity, acquittees and unfit defendants changed only in the 1990s, which I would suggest is very late on, and by which time the, un the response to unfitness and insanity acquittees contrasted markedly with what were otherwise broad, um, rather elaborate, technical and precise criminal rules and procedures elsewhere in the field. Now, beneath this de late or delayed formalisation, significant pockets of discretion remain. So, for instance, in the current era, we can see that the executive arm of government, in the form of the Home Office in England and Wales, for instance, continued to govern the way in which restricted or forensic patients were dealt with up until 1981, when the European Court, another European Court decision of X and the UK, forced the creation of the Mental Health Review Tribunal, an independent body now tasked with determining whether absolute or conditional discharge, etc., will flow. But it's notable that the Home Office still has, the Home Secretary has, still has um, a number of roles in relation to such patients. And again, we can see in England and Wales that discretionary life sentences, the time spent in prison beyond a tariff set by the court, continue to be determined by panels which form part of the Department of Corrections. So even though the Chief Justice is involved in some way, there's actually a, a panel that really is part and parcel of another arm of government operating there. So this leads me to think that what we actually see when we look at preventative detention is the juridification of what was formerly an informal and discretionary process. And so in this historical light, what's notable is actually not so much that it's now part and parcel of an elaborate array of rules and procedures that are governed by courts or with courts at the centre, but rather that that process is actually historically an, a, a change, a difference. And it seems to me that there's value, interpretive value in thinking about preventative detention in this historical light. So for me, exposing the durability or longevity of the tradition of executive power over individuals with mental illness helps to explain the critical significance of um, the way in which we might understand preventative detention. So what it does, I would suggest, is that it sidelines or perhaps um, marginalises the way in which we might value or evaluate these preventative regimes in relation to judicial power, so in relation to courts. So whether we focus on due process or we focus on the way in which a court evaluates evidence of dangerousness recedes. And further, we might think that the issue of whether or not these regimes are criminal or civil becomes slightly marginal. That's a very vexed issue, as I think everyone knows. This seems to me, this approach seems to me to have the advantage of avoiding any issues around whether we can slip between deterrence as a rationale for punishment and undeterrability as a justification for preventative detention. It also has the advantage of opening up another line of critique of preventative schemes, one which would enlist administrative law concepts like fairness and review alongside our more familiar say, criminal safeguards such as burden of proof. Now, I think this point about situating preventative detention regimes in the wider context of executive discretion has particular power in the Australian context, where our criminal law scholarship has been less closely tied to constitutional issues, uh, and it, of course, where we, have, where we do not have a Bill of Rights. And people might be aware of the debates about control orders in the context of terrorism and bikies that have enlisted precisely these kinds of issues around whether or not, for instance, it's appropriate that state courts operate in particular ways where executive power has been um, brought into the legislation but in actual fact is incompatible with their, judicial, with their judicial power under the federal constitution. Now, it seems to me that this raises a potentially salient point of difference between the European and the US traditions and perhaps I'll take a moment to explain exactly why I think this, is, um, this arises from thinking about executive power. It's because of the relationship between executive power and clemency in the US system where clemency in the US system has particular prominence. 
It resides exclusively in the executive at a federal level in the US and has been used for insane prisoners, those of good character and others, and it has a long and strong tradition, although I think with, um, in relation to presidential pardons, for instance, we'd have to acknowledge that it's a rather controversial um, power at the moment. It seems to me that this feature of the US system, which has been wrestled away from the executive in systems such as the UK, is arguably one distinctive and interesting feature about the US, um, at least from the outside, and prompts me to ask whether or not if we were to take this role of clemency in the US system seriously, whether it has any influence on how we might understand the way preventative detention has developed and the court's response to preventative detention regimes. So I conclude with a question for Chris. Does the place of clemency in the legal system in the US help to account for the approach encoded in Kansas and Hendricks or its relative absence in the more formalistic, I'm quoting Chris, and the more nuanced approach taken by the court in M and Germany? I guess I'll answer that one, then I'd love to hear from the audience. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. I think it's a good one. I think it's fair to say that clemency is not used prolifically in the United States and that governors and presidents who exercise their clemency power are probably not particularly focused on risk, as we've been talking about in this conference, but rather are focused on other kinds of issues, uh, whether it's been racial discrimination, whether there's been um, uh, any kind of mitigating circumstances come up in the meantime, or uh, as occurred in Illinois, whether too many people in prison, we need to reduce the prison population. Uh, and finally, of course, being cynical, it's political reasons uh, why it might be used. So I think it's an interesting question, but I, I doubt seriously it's, it's seen as a major safety valve along the lines that preventative detention could be seen. Okay, um, we have half an hour for, dis for discussion and um, I want to give people who haven't had the opportunity to speak an opportunity to ask questions and I'll be giving them preference, uh, uh, but uh, hopefully I'll get to everyone who wants to ask a question. Um, Velna, would you like to make a point? I can't see that. Uh, question for um, Professor Slobogin. Um, I was wondering, how can we get around this issue of um, control and uncontrollable impulses? If we agree that um, those undeterrable are not psychotic and they have this, uh, some, some irresistible urge or they, they, they can't control their behavior, um, um, well, we have to accept that we don't really have any scientific means of measuring control I agree. and that in that regard, uh, you, we don't really need any experts because um, judges and, and, and lawyers can probably make inferences from either what they said or what they had done equally well as, as, as experts can do. So first of all, you don't, you don't need experts. And second point is um, um, uh, unless there is some sort of fancy test developed one day to, to measure control, it, it's really uh, unscientific evidence mm -hmm. and therefore it perhaps doesn't even pass admissibility tests. Right. Uh, so I was just wondering, is the, wh what are your thoughts about the, yeah, this I, particular I, problem? Very good question. Of course, you could argue, as some people have, that we have no scientific basis for assessing risk either. And so the whole enterprise is sullied. But let's just focus on what you just said. Um, it is very difficult to figure out degree of volitional impairment. Um, as Steve Morris used to say, there's no ergometer that tells us scientifically just how strong a person's urges are. It would have to be done, I think, through a seat of the pants mechanism because we don't have anything even akin to actuarial instruments in this particular area. I don't find that to be a huge problem. I mean, there are all sorts of issues that are resolved through juries by lay people. Um, you don't have to have expert testimony on every issue that's confronted by the legal system. You'd have to present, if you're the prosecution, present evidence to suggest the guy has no, contro has no control. And if you're a defense attorney, you'd try to suggest he or she does have control. Um, I think the danger, which is what I think Heather was trying to get at, is that that word, undeterability, despite my attempts to refine it, is so amorphous that prosecutors will try to expand the envelope and say anyone who's committed more than three offenses is undeterrable, QED. Um, that would be the lay testimony, the lay evidence that would suggest undeterability. Uh, I think over time, though, there would be, if the judges take what I say seriously, there would be more of a refinement of what undeterability means and it would be limited to a very narrow range of people. 
but I don't think it should require experts. I, I don't advocate for that. I think you're absolutely right. We don't really have any scientific erdometer that could help us address that issue yet, and probably not in the foreseeable future. Hi, um, is that on? Yeah, Rebecca Welsh from University of New South Wales. I'm going to continue on the evidence point a little bit, but through a different lens. Uh, the seven principles look great. <laughs> um, it appears That's what everybody that, says, but they say, but. <laughs> but <laughs> it appears, I mean, to me, what they're driving at is to try and imbue preventative detention procedures with some sense of natural justice or the rule of law. And to be perhaps devil's advocate, um, perhaps just take an extreme view and something that maybe Ali's presentation accounted for would be to say, I don't know if natural justice and the rule of law is possible in preventative detention proceedings. And what I'd focus on again is this, what Andrew called rigorous evidence as being something that's required. So if you have any kind of proceedings where, oh well, by what you described, Chris, uh, the government brings an actuarial report, which regardless of problems and, and weaknesses and strengths, um, is the most weighty thing in that courtroom or in that tribunal hearing. Um, and the judge is faced otherwise with the detainee trying to meet that case with perhaps much less compelling evidence, but certainly an almost insurmountable case of crystal ball gazing, of trying to meet some amorphous risk threat thing that they pose in the future. Perhaps danger, perhaps sexual violence, perhaps who knows what. But to try and answer that case, um, so far as I see it, is almost impossible. Um, and impossible to do with any kind of strong sense of due process. Okay. And as so far as I see, the periodic review um, doesn't help that much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think those are both good points. Um, on your natural law point, I don't know what natural law means. I mean, it all depends upon your first premises as to whether you can find a natural law explanation or justification for preventive detention. Um, I think one way of doing it, at least for people with mental illness, is to say we are a society that values autonomy. That that's one of the preeminent values in our society. So that generally we require that before we can confine someone, the person must make a rational choice to commit a crime. Otherwise, we can't confine them. Conversely, however, if the person is not autonomous, is not rational, then it's permissible to preventively detain the individual. And this, I think, is a natural law kind of explanation. The logic being that it doesn't devalue autonomy to preventively detain a non-autonomous person. Okay, so that could conceivably ex justify preventive detention of people with mental illness. Uh, to say there's no natural law explanation for preventive detention period means we can't justify not only post-sentence commitment, we can't justify preventive detention of people with mental illness, which we've done for centuries. Um, and we can't prevent it, we can't justify quarantine, we can't justify prison of war camps. I think, in fact, and this is what I try to do in some of my other writing, you can develop, I guess, what you'd call a natural law approach to it. I didn't go into that in detail, but I think it's possible to do so, based on what we think about autonomy and the role autonomy plays in society. Um, as to your second point, which is a pragmatic one, I think a very important one, and I think Heather got into this as well, it is true that if the prosecution presents actual evidence, a probability estimate, that's going to carry enormous weight in the courtroom. However, and it, granted this is a huge assumption, if the court sticks to the risk proportionality principle and requires a high degree of certainty before someone can be preventively detained, the prosecution is not going to be able to meet that level in a vast majority of cases. For instance, if you set it at 50% based on what Ian said, we don't have an actual instrument that can produce a probability ratio over 50%. It's not possible. My guess is what would happen realistically is they drop it to 40%, but that's still or, or a <laughs> low percentage of, uh, well, actually, I disagree with Ian as to, as to how bad we are at actual instruments. I think we, yeah, I know. I think we can come with probability estimates a little bit higher than 15. Um, but, and for instance, the violence risk assessment guide is actually pretty impressive in that regard. Um, but I don't want to get into a huge debate about that. I think that would be a debate for mental health professionals and statisticians. Um, how, that would be one limitation on the weight that actual instruments would have, is that you set that, that risk level pretty high before you could preventively detain someone. Secondly, interestingly enough, there's been empirical research on precisely the question that you're, you're raising. And it turns out that actual risk assessment is much less influential on decision makers than clinical risk assessment. When you have a psychiatrist sitting on the stand in a three-piece suit, sort of talking to the judge in down-home kinds of terms, judge, I think this guy's really dangerous. Or to use an example from American case law, I'm 110% sure this guy's going to do it again. 
That's a lot more influential than an actual instrument that produces a probability rate of 30%. Now, I'm not going to say the judge won't also preventably confine in the latter situation. It just brings home just how bad we are at risk and in a very concrete way. And there's research that verifies, I'm not making this up, by Daniel Krauss and others over and over again, they, they've replicated this result. So I'm, I think you're right, actual risk uh, prediction can be influential, but not as influential as I think maybe you were suggesting. <clears throat> Uh, oh, yeah, okay. everything depends on the kind of judges you have and the kind of lawyers you have, yes. Uh, okay, can I just be permitted a, a short uh, interjection, and then I'll be taking, uh, I'll be directing traffic, as it were. Rebecca, I understood your question was about natural justice rather than natural law. Was that the concept? Oh, well, I, I don't distinguish too much between the two, so yeah. I'll, I'll give you the same answer. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I think one thing that, and this, of course, is all the Australians here would, uh, especially the lawyers, would know that... Um, would appreciate that Chris's talk is steeped in a tradition and a constitutional history of due process. Mm. And of course, mm. we have nothing, we don't have that in Australia. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm not sure what it means. Yeah, because yeah, we, we talk have, about the Constitution. We have this, we have this normative <clears throat> vacuum. Yes. Uh, Good point. And, Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, Patrick of, course, uh, mm. uh, of course, the, the cable principle and, and what we've been working with over the last uh, 10 years in that space is, the, is really the constitutional equivalent of saying, judges just shouldn't do this mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, it's it's like that uh, scene in the Monty Python movie where the um, fellas had his arms and his legs cut off and he's bleeding from every limb uh, and he says come back here and I'll bite your legs off um, so uh, so we don't we don't have those due process principles which provide so much of the uh, uh, you know the normative foundation for the for the seven yeah. principles but um, I, I, I know the cable decision I just have a hard time understanding it because I come from the American tradition but to say that it's not a judicial function to preventively detain people is just totally off base, in my opinion. Um, courts preventively detain people all the time, pretrial detention, civil commitment, all sorts of other contexts. So I, I didn't understand, I mean, I, under, yeah. I read the Cable decision, I think it's well reasoned in the Australian tradition, yeah. but I think at the same time it would be um, hard to justify the ultimate conclusion that no sort of preventive detention is permissible because courts do engage in it all the time and have for centuries. Okay. Um, Ashley, would you like to? Just for something different, I've recently Professor Jane Ogloff of Monash University I know conducted a report, um, and if I could preface it with Queensland refused to uh, comply with the request. But of all the reports written on every man in Australia for the purposes, um, Professor Ogloff came to the decision that the majority of psychiatrists were unable to use the tools that were available to mm -hmm. them, presented mm -hmm. information in court that was not valid, not reliable, yeah. and yet those same men still end up in jail or on right. orders. Yeah. I, I th and I think Ian was referring to that just a second ago. It depends on the jurisdiction and the experts and the judges and the lawyers. And you're right. Um, in many jurisdictions, there's total incompetence when it comes to making risk assessments, even based on the little scientific information we have. And that's a very important to, point to make. I want to inject one other thing, though, and this is probably why people think I'm a vociferous crusader for preventive detention. What is the alternative? Uh, one alternative is, and this is a question asked of John yesterday, one alternative is indeterminate sentencing. Well, we still have risk assessments there, right? We're still going to have the same problem with respect to figuring out who's dangerous and who isn't in that context. Another alternative is get rid of risk assessment entirely and just be entire, entirely backward looking in terms of who we deprive of liberty. How do we decide who to deprive of liberty in a backward looking fashion? Well, we figure out whether they've committed a crime which we're usually right about, though in the United States we've been wrong quite often, as the DNA uh, evidence has suggested. But let's assume we got that right. How do we decide how much time the individual gets in prison? Okay, the punishment model that Andrew was talking about this morning. Is it one year, four years, ten years? How do we do that in the United States and I assume in Australia? You look at mens re. You look at culpability. That, compared to risk assessment, is a total crapshoot. We have no idea how to assess culpability. There's nothing scientific about it whatsoever. And even if you know that a person intentionally committed, let's say, a theft, which often you can do, because he says, yes, I intentionally committed a theft, how do you decide whether that deserves one year, three years, or 10 years? It's simply what the legislature says. There is no scientific basis to that detention. Okay, now, granted, risk assessment's horrible, but so is culpability assessment. And I think it's worth throwing that into the debate. Again, I'm, I, I don't mean to sound like I'm a fan of preventive detention, but I think the alternative isn't necessarily all that much better in terms of accuracy. But just in a final response, yeah. I, and I think, Heather, you said it, that initially when it was proposed, the DPSI in Queensland, the guidelines issued by the experts who know everything 
said that, well, eight people possibly ten over the next 20 years. We now got 127 people, and they hope to expand it to 500 within the next 10 years. Yeah. 500 what? Um, well, we've got 17 in custody or so. 500 in, people in, in custody. Detention in Queensland. Okay. No. But you know, there are normally 20 in Queensland. And yet the experts that advised the government said we anticipate yeah. eight people. Yeah. Yeah. Eight people. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And that's, Absolutely. that's the point that John made. And that, that is a very scary proposition. And I will fully admit that that's a possibility. What's happening in the United States is we have preventive detention of the sort that John described yesterday and that I described today. But we also have, as John said yesterday, an incredible increase in determinant sentencing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we figure actually people are a lot more culpable than we thought they were just 20 years ago. So 12% of our prison population is there for life. That has nothing to do with preventive detention. That has to do with culpability assessment. These people, because they've committed murder, murder, rape, or maybe even armed robbery, deserve life in prison. To me, that's just as bad as all the preventive detention stuff people are talking about. <clears throat> Well, I, I mean, for me, the, the least drastic means principle is just really key here because there are, I think there are lots of people in preventive detention who actually need some kind of fairly extensive, in, not necessarily institutionalised, but support. And in fact, they're committing crimes in order to get back in there when they're being pushed <laughs> out by the judges. So it's almost... Uh, we're just taking this sort of shortcut straight into detention because it's an easy thing to do. Mm. And so we really have to have a lot more focus on to try to develop these appropriate supervision programs in the community. And obviously they're more complicated and they... That's why we need more people they, like Astrid. I and they don't yeah. take more resources. Mm. I mean, you know, mandatory, or, you know, preventive detention in maximum security units is obviously ridiculously expensive. So I think we're being very uncreative about, about this issue. Uh, Laura McDonough from Victoria Legal Aid. The net in Victoria is widening as well, but the figures sit somewhere along the lines of, I think there are currently about 35 men in Corella Place, which is our supervision order detention facility, and about 80 men in total currently on orders. I think it was originally envisaged we'd have about three or four per mm. year. Um, that said, we prosecuted, I think, 4,000 sexual offences through the Victorian courts in the last financial year, and uh, we all know that sexual offences are uh, said to be the most underreported that exist. So I would suggest that whilst I don't know what the alternative is, it's a cynical exercise in window dressing to think that banging up 35 blokes at Corella Place is deterring sex offenders or protecting the community right. in any meaningful or sensible way. Right. If I could say one thing in response to that, um, and again, I appreciate your point. I think it's a very good one. I think it is sort of a Band-Aid. Um, but on the issue of alternatives, my fear is, and this is reflected in the question I asked John uh, last evening, if we don't have selective incapacitation, that is, if we don't have a mechanism for identifying what we think are the most dangerous people, the 35 people, the eight people, what have you, what is the possible legislative response? The one possible legislative response is to incarcerate everyone for a long period of time. General incapacitation. That's happening in, the Ameri in America. That's my proof. In the United States, that's what's happening. Um, I don't know if it would happen in Australia or not. So again, I, I know I'm sitting like, sounding like a fan of preventive detention. I'm not. I'm just trying to get people to think about what the alternatives are. <clears throat> I mean, really, off the top of my head, and you know, perhaps some of these resources would be better spent educating the community about how to protect their children mm. and putting the resources into the things that mm -hmm. Douglas has suggested, such as uh, effective programs in the community to support people, and mm -hmm. particularly people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities. It's no surprise in the previous session that someone was mentioning Norway and Denmark as um, low-level imprisonment culture and that that connects in with their child protection. I was mentioning this in the break that, you know, less kids are taken away from their families and there's more intensive support at that lower level. And these systems are all interconnected. And um, I think the people talking before about how we need more of the um, expertise in the room from those kinds of fields is, is really true. Uh, my name's Alan Ward from Brisbane. Um, I, both Chris and Heather have raised the bit about the uh, clinical assessment of risk. Now I question the fallibility of the systems that are used uh, and I'll give you a, an instance. Now one psychiatrist, very prominent one here in Queensland that does these assessments, has turned around and said that at best he has a 40% chance of being right. Mm. 
Now, under the process that we have here in Queensland, you get three psychiatrists do assessments. Now, in one particular instance, two of those psychiatrists that assessed a particular person and wrote reports on him never even saw him. They wrote their reports based on the reports of other unqualified, unprofessional prison staff. Uh, now, how can they get something or predict risk on that basis? On that basis, that 40% diminishes down to about 10 or 15% at best. Now, if they're relying on information that can quite possibly be biased by a prison officer who someone had a head on with, as they frequently do with inmates, and then they go away and they write a report that uh, slams the inmate, and then that's considered in the assessment that's done by a psychiatrist who doesn't even interview the person concerned, how can that be a basis for anyone to predict risk? Yet, when it goes into court, that's not said that they didn't interview the prisoner. It's not, not even mentioned or placed in, the, in their report. I, I would just second the implicit criticism in that comment, and, it, and under the way I would interpret my principles, that would not be allowed to happen. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> my, my reflection on that comment, for what it's worth, is I think Ali's uh, 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 brief um, presentation today uh, and uh, focus on um, uh, the need to ensure that there's systems in place for administrative law principles of reasonableness and fairness to operate in that context is, is very valuable. Um, those of you from Queensland would be aware of Goff and the Regional Parole Board, uh, that decision um, where, um, uh, which demonstrates that there's some potential for Queensland judicial review legislation to operate in that context, but I think um, we're also well aware in Queensland that uh, there's insufficient resourcing of, of legal representation and, uh, and social workers to ensure that that system can operate uh, uh, productively and effectively. Uh, but it's a very important point that you've raised, Alan. Um, Ian? Just one point, uh, Chris. I'm not against the use of actuarials. <coughs> what I am against is undue confidence in the mm -hmm. results that so obtain. The single best estimate of risk is always the base rate of recidivism of the group, always. If you select base rates in terms of three types, just randomly, uh, up to perceived high risk needs, which is used in some of the literature, over 10 years it ranges from about 6 to about 21 per cent. If you then add an actuarial instrument on top of that and you simply look at a confidence interval around the score, you very rarely finish up with anything more than a few points, percentage points different that your confidence in compared to the base rate. That's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. It is, of course, intuitively obvious that if you've pre-selected someone for high risk needs and the base rate for that group is 21%, then clearly that's higher by a factor of nearly fourfold than those that are considered to have low risk needs. Mm -hmm. But is 21% enough to make a decision to lock someone up on the base? In I think that's a question we ought to be asking, and at least actual yep. instruments force us to ask it, as well, opposed to when you get a clinical risk assessment that says, oh, I think the guy's likely no, to be offender. Because it's dangerous. when you go further into that, who makes the decision to say this person fits within high risk needs? That's a clinical judgment right. that precedes the application of an actuarial instrument, and indeed the scoring of actuarial instruments includes clinical judgment. Mm -hmm. So to say that the two are uh, independent mathematically is just nonsense. And I'm of the view that really the only level of measurement we can apply is a, an ordinal level of measurement, low, medium, high. We cannot, the, the mathematics don't allow us to do any more. Would you call 20% high? Well, it depends what you're talking about. Well, then you're talking about that's what we need to talk about. And we need to talk yes, about what the percentage is. Then you're talking about the gravity of harm which is distinctly different from right, the probability to, right. of an event occurring. Right. We have to recognise those two can get conflated and do get right. conflated. Yeah, as I stated, the risk proportionality principle looks at probability and magnitude. I think it's a very important point. 
just to comment on something that you said before, Heather, um, around... Can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Um, people going back in under preventative detention orders and spending time in prison with one of the purposes to receive therapeutic programs yeah. while they're in prison. The absurdity of that is that for the 5, 10, 15, 20 years that they spent in prison under the original yeah, sentence, look. they weren't receiving any yeah, of that. Of course. So quite often people are getting out of prison uh, and then being put in under the guise of, put back in under the guise mm. of receiving programs mm. that you know, they should have received when they were yeah. in prison. I mean, this is one of the things that I was speaking to one of the judges who hears these cases in the Supreme Court and uh, she was saying all of the uh, resources are being placed now into the preventive detention category. So the people that are in prison waiting for the, to join these courses are missing out because there's all these people at the other end having to catch up and do their programs in order to be released. Um, you know, onto a supervision order. I mean, it's, it, it has completely taken up the Supreme Court's time in relation to these issues, and I, it is a, a real problem, obviously. And I guess it, it just suggests that there is now, there's clearly a lack of resources. There's not enough programs to go around to fit everybody in. Did you? What, what are you going to say? Okay. Oh, yeah. Debbie will be our last. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose a couple of things, just what you're saying, because I've heard here in Queensland, because we have a new government, that um, you know programs cut, are being axed, cuts, yeah. and it looks like uh, programs for uh, you know those convicted of sex offences are going to be cut. Apparently, now um, confirmation of that hasn't come, but um, we wouldn't be surprised because so many things are being slashed and burnt here in Queensland. But the other thing I just wanted to pick up from the woman from um, Legal Aid, I think, and it is about the broader issue, like I know that what we're here to focus on today, but I just want to um, keep in mind that there's so many, you know, where these types of offences occur under our own roofs with our family members. And a lot of this is really sort of framed up as stranger danger, if you like, and, and then, you know, like here you have Dennis Fergus again, you know, across the media as and you've got to look out for him. Well, you know, most of us, if not all of us, wouldn't let someone like him in our household anyway. It's about the protective mechanisms, how we educate our own children and for women to be able to be strong enough and supported enough to um, not allow, you know, or, um, you know, identify the signs of when it's happening you know, under our own roofs so we don't get to this point because there's more sex offen uh, sexual offences that occur under our own roofs that aren't um, you know, prosecuted and um, that's where I think a lot of the resources have to go. For more information visit bond.edu.au forward slash iTunes U.